So yeah, this talk's called APIs in the Scale of Decades. Um, it's by me, Gary Fleming. When I first started writing this talk, this tweet appeared the night that I started writing. I was like, that's a good starting point. It says, APIs are hard. They're pretty much ship now, regret later. I think that's often the case. Often when we put APIs in the world, we make mistakes. And we don't know the mistakes at the start. It's usually after we've built out for a couple of months, we start to realize that is not the API we need. So we start thinking about other things. We start to think about uh, hacks we can put in place, weird tricks we can pull, and it's never particularly good. Eventually, we try and make a version two, and then we've got two problems, right? We're supporting version two and version one after a while. Um, so how do we make it not regrettable? How do we change this problem? How do we solve it? So um, I, I've been thinking about this problem for years now, absolutely years, uh, API design in general. Um, how, how do we... How do we do it well? Um, and I'd like to say that after years of thinking that uh, I've got some good answers. I don't, so you can relax. I'm not going to tell you anything particularly useful. Right? You're relieved of that burden. What I'm going to try to do is give you some ideas. I'm going to give you some ideas that some of them might be OK, some of them might be a waste of your time. But more important than anything else, I want you to think. Yeah? I really want you to think. I'm one slide behind. Um, honestly, if we can achieve anything tonight, I want us to put the same um, application of thought and API design that we've put in any other areas. Like, there's many other areas of design and technology and scaling and all these other things that we have put no end of time into making better in the last five to 10 years. I don't think we've done that with API design. So I want you to start thinking about the problems. I want you to start thinking about possible solutions. If, if anything, I want you to walk out of this talk tonight thinking maybe there's a better way. Not having an answer, but maybe thinking there's a better way. And, and <clears throat> to be clear, um, when I'm talking about APIs, I'm mostly talking about network APIs. So that's where we expose a service over a network. Like we expose our, our web app over HTTP, or we expose uh, our data over HTTP, or you know, something like that. I'm not talking about sort of interface level APIs. Some of the stuff still applies there. It absolutely applies there. Um, but that's not necessarily what I'm talking about. So, um, a long time ago, um, a client of mine created a system, a system um, that is now legacy. Do you all know what legacy means? A anyone know what legacy means? Yeah, un un unmaintained is one way of looking at it. Um, usually it's someone else's mistake. Um, and sometimes it's your mistake from six months ago. In this case, it was a mistake made 30 years ago. They built an API. They built a system. The system was written in Perl. It was written in Perl 30 years ago. It's now a million lines of Perl. O over a million now. Um, some of it is desktop code. Some of it is server code. Some of it is batch code. And they know that it's going to take them a long time to rewrite it and get away from that. Partly because it's really hard to hire Perl developers. If you want to be rich, by the way, but hate yourself, learn Perl. Um, that's a little unfair. Some, some Perl developers uh, are happy, mostly because of the money. Um, but they wanted, they wanted in their replacement to try to find a better way. So they asked, you know, what would make an API last a long time? You know, if they were going to maintain another API for another 30 years, how do they get to the end of that and not regret it? So um, I, I asked a bunch of developers. Um, a bunch of developers, maybe about 70 to 80, um, from different areas, different backgrounds, different companies, what it is that they want in an API. They give me a lot of different answers, but the main three or four that I'm going to speak about tonight are these. They wanted it to be, be machine and human readable. Yeah, they wanted themselves to be able to look at it, which is reasonable. Um, I'm not a big fan of binary APIs myself. Um, but they wanted, obviously, a machine to be able to read it. I mean, it's no good writing your API in English. The computers don't understand that yet. Not very long until we do, but changeable. They want to be able to change over time. They want to be able to add to it, take stuff away, do, do something to it. They want it to be modifiable. Testable. They want to know that the thing that they built is the thing that they wanted to build. Yeah, that's a, a very simple definition of testability, that it's correct to some degree and some understanding of correctness. And it's documented. They want to know 
what all the bits and parts actually mean. There's no, there's no use for it to be readable, but not understandable, that they don't know how to use it. So um, I'm going to talk about, about uh, a fairly big idea that I think underpan and underpins a lot of what I think will solve those problems and make a good API. But I'm going to start with an example. Do we all recognize this young man? Has anyone not played a Mario game in the last 20 years? I'm guessing by the lack of show of hands, there's, everyone's played a Mario game in the last 20 years, at least since um, Mario 64. Excellent. So there's a spit switch in uh, Mario 64 called the ground pound switch. It's this thing here. Normally, what you do in Mario is you run and jump in things, and you kill them or activate them in some way. If you run and jump in the ground pound switch, you just kind of bounce off limply. Nothing really happens. Eventually, you remember that you've got this move called the ground pound. You jump in the air, you spin, and you slam down. Yeah, it's been in all the Mario games since Mario 64, all the 3D games anyway. Um, when you get the idea eventually to use it on the ground pound switch, which is never referred to by name, let's be clear, um, the switch activates. It works. Whatever was supposed to happen happens, and you get on with the game. Later, you meet uh, this character, uh, Mandybug. I think that was introduced in Mario Sunshine, but I can't quite remember. It could have been Galaxy. Um, I really should probably check that. I've said that so many times. Um, unlike the normal enemies, when you jump in its head, you kind of bounce off limply. Then you kind of notice something, right? You kind of notice that they've both got a thing in their back that looks kind of the same. So you jump over it, and then you do your ground pound. And it finally works. That's what you've been meant to do. You're supposed to ground pound the Mandy bug. And that star is a signal. Yeah, you're never being told to do any of that stuff. At no point does the game say, hey, go and ground pound either of these things. You learn it. And you've, once you've learned it for one thing, you see the pattern. It gets signaled to you. That's called affordance. So there was a, a perceptual psychologist called James Gibson, who in 1966 uh, coined the term affordance. So he was originally using it for something very different, very, very different than what I'm going to keep talking about. Um, he would use it to uh, describe the relational properties uh, that an actor would see in the world. So an actor, in this case, is anything with agency, a person or an animal. Not a, not a desk or a, a chair. They don't have agency. They can't take action in the world. So something that can see and act in the world. So when, when, we, um, when we look at a, an open savanna, we see affordance, right? We see an affordance that we can run there. When we see a, a dense forest, we do not see the affordance of running. We couldn't run in that environment. It's not possible. It's too dense. And we don't need to be told anything about it. No one signposts this stuff. We just kind of know it. Well, let me give you a solid example here, right? So a big cat like this, uh, this big cat here, sees a tree, and he says it's a place where he can hide or sleep or hunt from. He doesn't see it as a source of food. He just sees it as a bed. Meanwhile, the same tree, this bird sees it as a buffet it's covered in insects. The big cat's not interested in the insects. It can't do it with them. It doesn't perceive the tree as a source of food whereas this bird does. Meanwhile, the sloth just sees a hammock. Who's happiest? It's a sloth. Now, importantly, the tree didn't tell them anything. There was no information coming from the tree that wasn't already in the actor's mind. It's them that sees something in the world. That's, that's a, a fordance as they, they see it. Right, I know you probably weren't expecting a lot about uh, perceptual psychology. It's not normal for a talk, probably something uh, like .NET Sheffield, I imagine. Um, give me a minute. We will get back to APIs very, very soon, and you'll see how this is relevant. So um, in uh, 88, I think, Don Norman was a designer. Um, still, he's still a designer. Um, he wrote a book called The Psychology of Everyday Things in which he stole this term, or appropriated it, I think is the, the polite term. Um, he later qualified that he should have called it something else. He should have called it perceived affordance rather than actual affordance. Um, and I'll, I'll go into that in a second. 
basically what he was designing, uh, talking about uh, when he wrote his book was that if you've ever seen doors like this, which I appreciate the, the background's a little washed out at the moment, this can be really frustrating. So you've got two doors with uh, handles that you pull, and one says push, one says pull. If you've ever walked up to one of those push doors and pulled it, that's not your fault. You feel stupid, but it's just bad design. Yeah, that is bad design. It should be a plate. If it's something to push, you should have something that affords pushing, a plate. This is very simple, basic design. And the very fact that you have to put in a sign saying which one to do tells you you haven't designed well enough, right? You shouldn't have to do that. It should be obvious from looking. As actors, we should be able to see it and act. These are bad designs. Um, so designers care about this. They care about uh, the perceptions, perception of affordance, like how we see affordances. Um, perceived affordance is the term that Don Norman said he should have used, and it's very slightly different. So he, he imagines that, uh, imagine I was projecting a button on your screen just now. Um, kids would understand that as something that they could touch, because they've been brought up in a world where touching screens is normal, whereas most of you would know that that's just projected and wouldn't think about touching it. But the perception is there because you see a button, and that brings it with, with it a whole bunch of baggage. A more concrete example for, uh, for people who are roughly your ages. Um, I don't think we've got anyone too young. So, uh, sorry, that wasn't meant as an insult. You're all, you're all beautiful and pretty and young. Um, so if you saw that on a button, on an app or a web page or anything else, you would know what it does, right? What does it do? Saves, as they say in a quiet. When was the last time you picked one of these things up? A decade ago, okay. Um, I reckon it was 15 years ago for me. I reckon it's been a good long time, yet it persists. We see it and we perceive affordance. But that's very artificial, right? I mean, we know for sure that you're not necessarily saving to a disk, right? In the modern world, you're probably saving to some cloud server that might save to disk, it might save to memory. We don't even know. It's probably not saving to, uh, a floppy disk, though. Yeah, it's definitely not saving to a snack of them sitting in uh, AWS, I don't think. And more importantly, it would definitely not be saving to a picture of a floppy disk. That's not a floppy disk. That's a drawing. That's an SVG picture. It was never a, a floppy disk. Somebody drew that. So um, I'm skimming the surface of what Affordance says here to kind of give you uh, some groundwork. Don't go and try to impress your designer friends by pretending you understand it now because it will go poorly. I'm really kind of skimming the surface. All right, now we're gonna get back to it. Ooh, that's very faded. Does, any, does anyone know who uh, that man there is? Oh, squint, a lot of people squinting. I'm gonna lay away with this one because uh, that that's very washed out just now. So uh, that's Roy Fielding. Does anyone know who Roy Fielding is? Man in the center. Uh, yep. Correct. So uh, that's exactly it. In 2000, Fielding had been working on uh, a whole bunch of stuff, um, including Apache HTTPD, and he submitted his doctoral dissertation, which I'm gonna read, the architectural styles and the design of network-based software architectures, which, um, which is actually a good read. Um, surprisingly readable, I, I would recommend it. It's not too long, it's about 20, 25 pages of real important stuff, bibliography and all that sort of stuff. You don't probably need to bother with too much. Um, but it's a good read and I would pick it up and have a go. Because in it, he defined this, representational state transfer, or REST. Now imagine a whole bunch of you work on REST systems, right? Or systems that have REST APIs. I'm seeing some nodding and I'm gonna say, no you're not. Um, most people who write REST APIs have never seen a REST API in their life, or have never understood it as a REST API. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit. And yeah, I know the, the wording is kind of broken up kind of weird here. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, I saw it and I was like, I kind of like the way it's broken up, because it reminded me of something that um, a, a journalist told me once, which um, is interesting. See, see these little dots, you sometimes see them in dictionaries and word guides and stuff like that. Does anyone know what they mean? 
No, okay. Sorry? Good guess, but no. Um, a lot of people think it's syllables or pronunciation. It's actually where uh, they recommend word wrapping. It's the point at which an editor should uh, wrap a word. Now, to most of you, that was probably not something you'd ever thought about or ever saw. But if you knew that and you now know that, you can see it as an affordance. Yeah, this is where you should wrap your words. I mean, your computers will do it for you, but that's what that means. Anyway, so Fielding uh, said, um, what needs to be done to make the REST architectural style clear on the notion that hyperdict is a constraint? So he argues that um, REST is designed as a system for distributed hypermedia. Yeah, he keeps saying this over and over again through the last decade and a bit when people started taking on REST as a design pattern. Um, hypermedia is a constraint over and over. No one gets it, no one does it, and that's partly because no one really knows what hypertext is, not in the, any real sense. This is his definition, which is the simultaneous presentation of information and controls such that the information becomes the affordance through which the user obtains choices and selects actions. Eh, eh, what, what, what is that? I don't know. So, let me, let me simplify that a little bit. Information and controls together will give you better APIs. If you're gonna remember anything from the talk tonight, Remember this slide, information and controls together will give you a better API. You do not separate them out, you keep them in the same place. And the reason for that is that action contextualizes information which contextualizes action. There's a two way street between the state of things and the actions you can take on them. And then having taken an action, the new state of the world. If you keep that loop going forever, you'll have a much better API. So uh, imagine that um, you've got $100 in a bank account, and you immediately get offered, do you want to transfer up to $100? You know what your affordance is, right? You know that you can transfer money, and there is a limit to it. So you say, I want to transfer 70. Fine. The answer you get back is, you want $30. Do you want to transfer up to $30? Your actions are contextualizing other actions you can take in the future, and the state. Eventually, you give away the $30, and you get told, no, nah, you can't transfer it now, sad face. Yeah? That's an API control information uh, loop. Now, you probably want a more technical example than that than just spouting words. So, I'm hoping this is not too blown up. Um, have we ever seen how style JSON APIs before? Where, you know, you've got notionally like a bunch of items here, which I, I've kind of occluded. But then at the bottom, you have a kind of link section with some actions here. So this says, uh, there's only one link and it's next and it says href page equals two. So the idea is that you know, if you were to follow that link, you would get the next page of things. I'll go back to cats, it's easier. So you go to slash cats on your API and you get all the cats. But for most people, that's like too many cats. When you think about any sort of big collection of data, normally presenting it all back at once is far too many things. So, we start offering things like navigation. We offer links that say, uh, you can go to the start and get the first row, you can go to the next and get the next sort of page. So see, see Rose's pages here. You can't really get to the third page using this API for whatever reason, or you can jump straight to the end if you wanna do that and then kinda jump backwards from there. These kind of links are just basic navigation that we see. So if I'm in self and I say, go to next, it becomes self, the first row becomes previous, and the row we couldn't get to before that now becomes next. You know, it's just stepping through. And you don't have to figure out any weird sort of paging algorithms and worry about off by one errors because the server is telling you, rather than you work that stuff out, I'll work that stuff out and I'll do it once and I'll get it right. Because I know, like, having gotten people to work out a paging algorithm for about an hour, only about 30% of people can do it in an hour without off by one errors. They think they're right, but they get all sorts of boundary conditions wrong. We're really not good at doing this stuff. Anything that's gone off by one, people are bad at. Paging is not a hard problem, but yeah, give people an hour, they will not solve it. Apparently, it's because uh, people do weird stuff like um, put 11 cats in a row and not 10 and can't figure that out, um, that's what I did here. But it's better off to just let the server do it and let it take, offer the affordance of going to the next page rather than trying to do it yourself. 
Beyond that, we can add in stuff like filters. So we could say, just give me all the cat's eyes who have tears in them, which is uh, these ones here, which is small enough that there is only one page, which becomes the start self and end page. And sort, let's uh, sort them by orientation. So we put all the uh, sideways cats at the start and then all the other ones at the end. These are fairly basic generic controls that we would have in most data sets, right? It doesn't matter whether you work in car manufacturing or uh, music or albums or whatever it is you're exposing, like paging are very basic generic controls. But there are other things in the world that we want to do. Like these are not enough to be able to kind of afford ourselves in the world. So I like to think about this through kind of uh, text adventures. There are things that are generic, right? So if you've ever played an 80s text adventure, there are things that are pretty universal, like saying, go north, go south, go west. They would apply most, kind of, most of those text adventures. There are other things that would apply some of the time, like light fire. That would apply in like maybe a fantasy world or a wild west world, but not in a sci-fi world necessarily. Maybe, but probably not. Or kill dragon. Like kill dragon is like very, very specific. It's going to be weird if your sci-fi thing has a kill dragon option. Maybe space dragons um, could be. Or it could say something like kill jester, which is always a really good choice. Always kill your jesters. And it, the, the point is like finding verbs and nouns and putting them in your APIs that are very domain specific is fine. That's completely OK. There's no problem with doing that. No one would expect the sloth, who only cares about trees being hammocks, to kill a dragon, right? It's just, it doesn't make sense. It's okay to have APIs that are afforded with actions and nouns that are specific to your domain. One good way of actually kind of finding out what those should be um, is uh, thinking about an Alexa search or a, a Google Assistant search, yeah? Think what you would ask a home assistant to flush out your domain. So, I mean, I don't know what, what companies you work for, but let's say you're working the music domain, uh, kind of we search for albums, you might want to say, uh, give me all albums by Limp Biscuit because it's uh, the early 2000s and you hate your parents. Um, but you can start to kind of try that out and try it with customers and try it with other people to say, well, what, what nouns do your customers care about? What are the actual affordances in our domain? What actions do people want to take? And you can test it, you can test it in a corridor. You actually pull people in. Uh, this, this is my uh, my kind of main action, buy hoppy, a hoppy beer for Gary. Anyway, so I've talked about affordance and I've talked about controls and I did that for probably the vast majority of the talk because I think it underpins most of these things, right? I think affordance is documentation. I think if you put the nouns and verbs that you want people to use in your API, you have documentation at that point. You have meaningful, good documentation. It's not quite enough and we all get to the rest, but it's a good start. It's better than just giving up a lump of, here's a bunch of objects and giving them no way to manipulate them. So, part two, change. If you remember back at the start, people said there was like three or four things you wanted in APIs and one of them was change. They wanted to change it over time. So, um, I like to think about the, the ship of Theseus. Does anyone know the ship of Theseus? So yeah, it was posed by Plutarch and it was essentially that. Um, if you go to, Theseus goes out to sea and starts replacing his ship by, by, bit by bit, and eventually he replaces the whole thing, when he gets to the other side or comes back into Port Alexandria, does he still have the same ship? And there's different theories in this. Like, no, it's a, it's a big conundrum. Like, no one really knows. People will argue about it in different contexts. Um, there's some, some very good arguments about it. So the Mariological theory of identity, which I don't expect any of you to remember, there is no test, um, <laughs> argues that it's a new ship. Yeah, a ship, a thing is the sum of its parts. If you change a part, you change the thing. The spatial temporal continuity theory says, as long as you do it bit by bit, just one chunk at a time, then it remains, its, it keeps its thingness. You know, it doesn't really change, then it's still the same thing. I mean, if you completely replaced it with like metal parts and turned it into you know, a big metal warship, probably not the same ship, but you can change over time. I think as programmers, we, we can understand this pretty well, right? This, this is a versioning problem, right? When do we go from version one to version two? That, that is the heart of 
uh, Plutarch's paradox here. It's versioning. So how, how do we know? Well, for, first I want to try and offer you a solution to this by talking about bullet trains. Um, bullet trains in Japan were um, originally designed um, a bit weirdly, so they had quite a round fronts like most trains do. Um, not completely flat like a lot of British trains do, who kind of operate mostly outdoors, uh, but just slightly curved. And they found that when they went into tunnels, a lot of air pressure built up around them. And as they exited the tunnel, the air pressure kind of exploded out. And it caused like a sonic boom. Local residents hated them. I mean, they're, they're well loved now, but at the time they were well hated in any sort of big built up area, really despised. So they went back and re-engineered. And what they did was they looked at nature and they looked specifically at birds. And they found one bird, the kingfisher, who, when it enters water, causes almost no splash. It just goes in, grabs its bird, gets out, and there are no big ripples. The bird does not get time to move. Uh, sorry, the, the fish underwater don't get time to get out of the way. They're just pulled straight out. And they're like, well, if it doesn't cause ripples, that's kind of exactly what we need. And that's what they did. So that frontage there, where it's a big, long slope, is actually based on a kingfisher beak. True. So that's called biomimicry. So biomimicry is a really interesting field where people um, look to nature for design solutions. There's lots of places where we, we now copy designs from nature. And the reason is, you know, it's had millions of years to figure out a whole bunch of answers to simple problems that we are trying to hand engineer based on, on principles from you know, building stuff out of wood and simpler materials. Bioengineering, biomimicry is actually kind of interesting. And I'm going to say that the way that we solve the versioning problem is do what nature does, which is don't. Nature does not have version numbers. Evolution just keeps stepping on and on and on. Think about it this way, right? There was never a point where there was an old version to. Yeah, that's an old headphones on. It's uh, kind of blown out there. Right? And the owls we had. 1,000, 10,000 years ago are not the owls we have today. They're just not. The owls we have in 20,000 years from now will not be the same. And that's kind of weird to think about. But there'll still be owls. There'll be different owls, but you won't notice many of the steps along the way unless you're really paying attention. And that's kind of what we should be going for. Making lots of small steps along the way that no one notices so that no one needs to know about the version numbers. Affordance trumps versioning. If we provide only the actions that people can take at any point in time, with some reasonable knowledge of the domain, then you don't need version numbers anymore. And I know that's weird. I know some of you are a little freaked out by that idea. Usually at least one angry person comes to me at the end and is very upset that they're uh, URL with a slash v2 in it is kind of crap, and it is kind of crap. I'm sorry, it is. Um, but that's the truth. And the thing is, like, you're used to dealing with this problem all the time. In other parts of your job, you don't really think about it. You deal with it every day. So you probably can't see this too well, but that kind of background picture there is a web page. It's GitHub. It's actually the GitHub uh, API in which I store the slides for this talk, which I thought was fun. I like the cyclality of it. No, that's not a word, is it? Um, but you don't know when you go to GitHub, whether that's version 1, version 10,005, or version 9,004. You don't know. You're never going to know. But you deal with it because you apply your domain knowledge to navigating that page. You've got a task in mind. You understand the domain. You understand branches, forks, issues, files, all the main domain elements of GitHub. And you understand the actions you can take, like cloning or copying or any number of other things. <coughs> so you look at it, you find your affordance, you click the button, and it does what you want. They can move everything around. They can turn the entire page upside down. You still be able to navigate it. And that's because that is afforded. And it's afforded in a way that you can understand. You deal with it all the time. So change is inevitable. So change. Get used to that idea that we can constantly make small changes to our API. So one of the other things that people said they wanted was testability. Um, 
Why is that? Like, why do people want testability? It's the same reason that cars have brakes. Cars have brakes so they can go faster, not slower. If you can test something, if you can prove that you haven't broken it, if you can make sure that you haven't broken it for someone else who you care about, you can continue your work faster without big integration cycles at the end, which is one of the things that kills API design when you version. You have to go through a whole big new test package. You have to go through a whole new cycle. It's just not a good, smart way of building things. And we're saying we're going to build for change. We have to test for change. The two things go together. How do we do that? Well, if you control both ends of the wire, if you control um, the server and it's other people in your own organization or clients or customers you can talk to, you've got a pretty good tool at your disposal. These things called consumer-driven contracts. Has anyone ever used a consumer-driven contract before? Yeah, maybe some, some not sure hands. OK. So a consumer-driven contract's an interesting way of doing testing and integration testing, especially in a world that's going to change. If you've accepted evolution, this is the way to do testing. So the idea is that your clients look at your API and say, well, I'm going to make this call. When I take this action with these parameters, I expect a response that looks like this. And I'm going to use you know, field A, B, and D, but I'm not going to use C or E. Yeah, that makes sense? They state that in a test. Their consumer-driven contract library uh, then generates a fake server for them. It knows, well, OK, you're going to make this call in, and you expect this kind of data back. And that gives them a nice little test loop that they can use. Their test li uh, the test library, the consumer-driven contract library, also generates a second version for the server. They then send that to you. Just automatically send it to something, a system that you control. On your side, you then get, you've then got a list of the client's expectations. You get to say, well, oh, the client, when the client calls this, uh, they're expecting some kind of answer. Let's see what happens. It will generate a fake client that you can run against your server, send back your real answer, and then it go, yeah, you give us back field A and B and D, that's fine. Or it goes, oh, you've got rid of B, or you've changed the shape of it, or something's gone wrong. Yeah? At that point, you know immediately when you've broken your uh, clients, when you've broken people who want to integrate with you. And that's what consumer-driven contracts are about. They're about knowing that you have broken your clients when you've moved to this kind of evolutionary, non-version world. You can use it without going into that, but if you're going to go into that kind of world, it's a very handy tool to have. Um, other things you can do, fuzzers. If you want to ensure that they're telling you everything that you need to know, then modify any part of your API without contract coverage. So if they are saying, um, if they're saying that they require A, B, and D, but not uh, C or E, maybe in a test environment, just completely randomize those fields. If they actually get broken and phone you up, you know they didn't tell you the whole truth. So fuzzing kind of helps with that. Scramble links. If we're saying that we're going to use these links as a way of kind of navigating in rather than getting clients to do it themselves, then scramble the links, again, in a test environment. Force them to actually use the, uh, the affordance rather than trying to uh, retrofit your API. You know, where we say slash page equals two, just put in a UUID that only your server can understand. And add in dummy data. I I've worked with clients who have said, oh, you've broken something, because they were like getting a lump of JSON back and then going, well, the thing we need starts at character 36. And then jumping to character 36 and reading in a list of data, rather than actually dealing with the structure and parsing it properly. So randomize the structure and move it around. I know that one sounds kind of weird, but it, it is necessary sometimes, because somebody will do something odd. So break assumptions and think in affordance. Every action should be achievable through an affordance. All right, this is the last part, which is good, because I think I've got 10 minutes left. So I've argued for affordances. I've argued for presenting information uh, together and using tests to make sure it all works. And if you remember at the start, I did say that these were the things that people said they needed or said they thought were important in an API. These were the top four. Are there other things that we want? Well, the other things that people said were they wanted it to be easy to navigate. Uh, so people had used kind of how stuff before. 
They want it to be easy to update data, so be able to change things. Compressible, I, I never really understood that one. I don't, it's never been an issue I've had. Maybe they're doing something different, I don't know why, but they wanted to make sure their APIs were compressible. It came up a weird number of times. <clears throat> they wanted lightweight structures, and by this they meant, you know, um, maps, lists, arrays, just not like big deep object structures, but just kind of lightweight structures that they could then use to structure their API. And like, yeah, fair enough. Um, that, that's reasonable. Optional types, not necessarily having to use types, but uh, types that can help say, well, this is a car, and the car has these parts. And existing tooling, no one wants to write their own stuff, or no one wants to use something that has very limited tooling. Which again, fine. So I've talked about hypermedia in terms of um, navigation, of how we use it to kind of move around and how we use it to afford our APIs. But the thing that I haven't mentioned is the other form of hypermedia, which is how do we talk about structure or the form of things, the shape. And that's what form is, it's uh, the shape something takes. And there's different ways of describing that. And it's important that when we talk to each other, that both sides understands, yeah, we both mean the same form. So to give that a good concrete example, right? So if, we took, if we're trying to describe a person, a person can have a given name, a last name, an email address, a date of birth, and these will have slightly different types, like uh, text up to a maximum length. Uh, a birth date has a, a very fixed structure, you know, it's a date. We would expect to see a date in there, not. Um, not an image, for example, that doesn't make sense. But your API and my API might differ. I might only want your name and your email address, and you might want all that stuff. So it's really important we have a way of talking to each other and saying, by the way, when we are talking about this kind of thing, I want these things, I want these parts. Yeah, so that's the other side of hypermedia, not just links, but form. So why do we write our APIs in JSON? Why have we gone there? It doesn't have a hypermedia link type. There are no links in JSON. There's like five or six different standards that have kind of patched it back in, but there's no standard way of doing it. And the first time I did this talk, there were only five ways I could find. In the time that I've been doing this talk, which is less than one year, a sixth way has been added. It's only gonna get worse. We're not gonna be able to standardize on any of this stuff because fundamentally JSON is not fit for purpose. It's no real way of describing forms or hypermedia links. One well, the reason it got popular was actually kind of simple, right? It's XML. XML was problematic, right? That was, that, that's just true. Um, XML was verbose. Lots and lots of words in there. Lots of parts, hard to read because of the verbosity. It doesn't really have any structures of the type we talked about before, you know, arrays, lists, maps. It's kind of, you can half invent them yourself because it's infinitely nesting, but XML by itself doesn't have lightweight structures. It doesn't have arrays. You can nest everything inside everything else, but then you have to decide what that actually means in terms of structuring. It's arbitrarily complex and extensible. There are so many standards in that space and so many competitors building tooling around it that it became hard to really deal with a lot of it. Um, you, could, you could write a simple XML API, some people did, a lot of people didn't, especially if you started getting any vendor products like some of the work that um, IBM did and what eventually became SOAP, if you ever had to uh, deal with that monstrosity. There's a whole bunch of other things. But we also have to remember why we're using XML. It's because it was better than what came before. XML was better than the proprietary formats that happened before it. It gave us Unicode as a basic thing as something that we then had that we could use. Unicode as a compatibility layer, fantastic. Having lightweight, uh, having a sort of uh, the basic parsable structure XML that everyone standardized on, you know, tags, links, XSD, all that sort of stuff, was way better than the proprietary stuff that happened before. But we had to move on because there were other problems, and that's why we got to JSON, and JSON has problems. So, what solves the problem? How do we get the, the benefits uh, that we want, the things we've talked about for uh, the last uh, 30 minutes or so? I'm gonna argue that the answer is HTML5. I'm gonna argue it's HTML5. It has it all. 
So think about this, right? If you've agreed with any part of my argument to this point, we know it has links. It calls them links. Yeah? And we know it has forms. It calls them forms. You can describe stuff really well. It has structures. You have lightweight structures as well. So it's got lists, it's got kind of maps, it's got a whole bunch of interesting, very lightweight structures in there. I'm not saying you use the whole HTML5 spec. There's lots of stuff in there that is not relevant to APIs. It's unlikely you'd want to use the quote tag or the marquee, although I think they removed marquee recently. But there's plenty of lightweight structuring in there you could use. It's types. So in the sense that um, Google, Facebook, and uh, Yahoo, and some other big uh, corporates have got together and specified microdata as a parallel standard to HTML5, it has those types. Like It's got well, well-defined mechanisms for describing um, people and dates and diaries and restaurant bookings and cars and objects. Pretty much any basic thing that you want to describe, there is a microdata standard of how you specify it in HTML5. We can do it really well. And it's lightweight. You don't have to use it. If you don't feel like using it, don't. If you've got some niche in your own domain, you can write your own microdata format. I would suggest standardizing first, but it's there. You have that. And tooling. Would anyone argue that HTML5 doesn't have tooling? It's some of the best tooling on the planet that you use every single day. It's got lots of interesting parts. And like I said a while ago, right, you deal with this every day. So my GitHub example, um, where I talked about the affordances and the links and the buttons and things like that, yeah, it's designed to be presented to you, a person. If you stripped away all the CSS and said, OK, this is not for people. This is actually for machines. And you're stable about your IDs, and you made sure your affordances were, were well structured and understood because they had the right IDs and types and all that stuff as part of it. And you evolved it very slowly over time. And any changes you put through this same change process and use consumer driven contracts and all that other stuff, then it works. And you deal with it every single day. So I'm arguing write your APIs using HTML5. Am I serious? Um, am I serious? Nah, nah, maybe. I, I don't know. I said at the start, what I wanted you to do was think. I've made a reasonably serious argument for using HTML5 and affordances and all these other things. And I think there's some good ideas in there. I think there's some that are a waste of your time. But I want you to think about it, right? I know some of you are probably going to hate everything I've said. I usually at least two people are very angry in the end of this talk, and some people really like it. But I want you to think about it. I want you to present me with a coherent argument as to why it is a bad idea. And if you find flaws, as a little thought experiment, try and argue yourself out of it. Think about how you'd solve those flaws. Because this talk is not about telling you how your APIs, it's about making you think better about APIs. Thank you. Um, just uh, as a wrap up, um, that's my Twitter. All the slides for this are on uh, this GitHub URL, which is the one presented in the talk, uh, Gary Fleming APIs for Decades. I will tweet that out later at some point. Um, but yeah, that's it.